All right, let's go, please, if you would, to the book of Ezra, chapter 1. Now, we didn't finish our lesson last time. I, I did have, I do have lesson 2 finished, but I thought, well, we'll just go ahead, because what will happen, we'll be halfway through this and then halfway through the next one. So we'll try to finish this one today, and we should be able to do that, no problem. And then we'll start uh, on our lesson next time, speaking about the journey back. But this morning, we're continuing to look at the promise that God has made uh, to the Jewish people. And that promise, of course, is still in effect today. Here it was uh, all these years uh, before Christ, uh, you know, 500 years B.C., and we find them coming back to the land of promise. God had promised judgment because of their sin, because of uh, uh, them disregarding this, the, the land, Sabbaths, for 490 years. And so they had to pay it all back at one time. And so the land uh, rested for 70 years while they were taken to Babylon and captivity. So we looked, and hopefully you have still got your notes from last week. We had a few extras we brought with us today. And so last time we looked at the promise of captivity, captivity, and now we're going to begin looking at number two there, the promise of Cyrus. So let's look at the Second Chronicles chapter 36 and verse 22. It says, Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom, and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth hath the Lord God of heaven given me, and he hath charged me to build him an house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Uh, who is there among you of all his people? The Lord his God be with him, and let him go up. Now, God promised that even though uh, they would have been in captivity for and really the undergoing the judgment of God, that he would not forget about his people. And really what we find here in the last verses of Second Chronicles, which is actually repeated in Ezra chapter 1, verses 1 to 2, um, is the fact that God had not forgotten his people. Look back at Leviticus chapter 26 again. And in Leviticus 26, you have both the, the curse and the blessing. Uh, we find the, the judgment mentioned in verse 31, down to verse 35. And verse 33, it says, And I will scatter you among the heathen, will draw out the sword after you. Your land shall be desolate, your cities waste. Then shall the land lo uh, enjoy her Sabbaths as long as it lath waste, and ye be in your enemy's land. Even then shall the land rest and enjoy her Sabbaths. But if you look over verse 44, we find the promise of God's grace and long suffering. And yet for all that, when they be in the land of their enemies, I will not cast them away. Uh, neither will I abhor them to destroy them utterly and to break my covenant with them, for I am the Lord their God. But I will for their sakes remember the covenant of their ancestors whom I brought forth out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the heathen, that I might be the Lord, uh, or be their God, I am the Lord. And by the way, the same covenant is still in effect today. The Abrahamic covenant is an unconditional promise. And so even though Israel is partly back in the land, they're basically half of them are there. There's like 13-something million Jews in the world. Seven million are there. Uh, so it's basically half and half. Um, and yet the Bible promises that they will all come back to the land one day and God will fulfill his promises to them. So God has, hath not cast off his people forever. Uh, all Israel shall be saved. Blindness in part has happened to Israel because God will keep his promise. And so here um, he brings them back uh, into the land. Now, the interesting thing that we find here is that God actually names this Persian king. We've read about him in 2 Chronicles 36 and in Ezra chapter 1, uh, this king of Persia uh, called Cyrus. And Cyrus, <clears throat> the, the Bible says that the, that the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia. God put it in his heart. <clears throat> Somehow <clears throat> this man knew of Jehovah God. And he says in verse 23 there, that the Lord God of heaven hath given me uh, all the kingdoms of the earth, and he uh, has charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem. So, you know, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. It was the Lord that uh, put this in Cyrus's heart, you know. Um, it wasn't that the Jews pled for Cyrus to do this for them. 
God was working on the inside. The Jews didn't do anything. It was Cyrus that came up with this idea, stirred up by the Lord to begin with. But I want you to look at this. Look at Isaiah chapter 44. This is one of the most, uh, one of the marvelous prophecies that we find in the book of Isaiah. And that is that God named the, this leader of Persia before he was ever born. In, the, in Isaiah chapter 44, uh, verse 26, it says, <clears throat> speaking of the Lord that confirmeth the word of his servant and performeth the counsel of his messengers, that saith to Jerusalem, thou shalt be inhabited, and to the cities of Judah. Now, Isaiah was written before Nebuchadnezzar came in. Isaiah is, is pre-exile. Uh, Isaiah ministered in Judah before Nebuchadnezzar came in. And God is warning his people. That's you know part of the reason for you know the outline for Isaiah is grown glory. And the grown part is where he's warning and warning his people that judgment is coming because of their sin. And in the last part of the book, he goes forward in time looking at the promises of God and how that there will be glory. And most of those promises are about Christ and his kingdom. Uh, but uh, you have to understand this is written before even Nebuchadnezzar. Now you remember Nebuchadnezzar is king of Babylon. And uh, Babylon is, is the primary captor of Judah for 70 years. And then at the end of that period of time, remember Belshazzar, the writing on the wall. That's, that's when Babylon was defeated by Media Persia. And of course this is all secular history. And Media Persia, and you read about it uh, in Daniel uh, chapter 5. And Darius was the Mede that came in. And remember, you know, you had Medes and Persians and represented Babylon, head of gold, arms and silver, arms and breast of silver. You got two arms, Media Persia. And Cyrus was the Persian. And Darius would have been the Mede. And so they, they, they had these joint kind of rulerships. But... Um, so anyway, before uh, Medes and the Persians were in power, before Cyrus was ever born, uh, notice what it says down here in verse 26 again, uh, speaking about Judah being inhabited. Thou shalt be inhabited in the cities of Judah. Uh, ye shall be built, and I will raise up the decayed places thereof. And so he's actually looking forward to the time after this judgment, before the judgment had taken place. That saith to the deep, be dry, and I will dry up thy rivers. That saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and shall perform all my pleasure. Even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built, and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. And here's God prophesying through Isaiah uh, what this, uh, this man would do. And he's basically describing the control that God has over this man. That this man is the shepherd of the Lord. That he's going to... Uh, execute God's will, uh, specifically concerning Jerusalem and the temple, saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built, and to the temple, thy foundation shall be laid. Now remember, now, later on, Artaxerxes gives the commands, we'll see this in a moment, to go back and build the walls of Jerusalem. But the first king was the Persian king Cyrus, um, who instructed the Jews, and it wasn't any particular, Jerubbabel became the leader, but it was basically any, anybody who's willing and wants to go, this is what God's put on my heart to do. And he basically instigated uh, Cyrus to Look at verse 40, chapter 45, verse 1. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue nations before him. And I will lose the loins of kings to open before him the two-leave gates, and the gates shall not be shut. In other words, uh, God is going to help Cyrus to be a conqueror. Verse 2, I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in sunder the bars of iron. And I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places, uh, that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee, now watch this, which call thee by thy name, am the God of Israel. Why does he mention the fact that he's calling him by name? Because Cyrus wasn't even born yet. This is like 150 years before Cyrus comes to be the king. Uh, and he wasn't 150 years old. This is long before he was born. So God called him his name before his parents then. Look at verse uh, 4. For Jacob my servant's sake and Israel mine elect, I have even called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. All right. So 
uh, here he was a heathen king, didn't know the God of Israel. And I think he did come to know the God of Israel, but God named him. God knew him before he knew God, and God gave him his name, Cyrus. Verse 5, I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, thou hast not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. You see, the Bible uh, describes God as one who knows the end from the beginning. If you just turn over the page to chapter 46, verse 9, he says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying that my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. That's the, one of the wonderful hallmarks of Scripture is that God tells you the end from the beginning. He tells you what's going to happen in the future. And here's a, a situation where he actually names this king of Persia before Persia was a, a world power, before Cyrus was even born. Isn't that an amazing thing? Amen. Now, you know, they'll say, well, they went back and, and wrote that in somehow, but that's not the case. Uh, and, and that's why, and if you read it the way he, he, uh, that, that it's read here, he makes this point that God is naming him by name uh, and making that point that it is a sign uh, to Judah. So Cyrus became king of Persia. In 539 B.C., this is written about 712 B.C., so there you can see the difference in time. Uh, as we think about uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 36, if you go back there, and Ezra chapter 1, uh, the, the last book in, in the Old Testament, in, 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 the region, in the books that we have as they're arranged together, um, uh, the last book of the Old Testament is what? Malachi, right? Uh, keep your place there in Second Chronicles 36 and go over to Malachi chapter 4 and notice how the Old Testament ends as it is given in the canon of Scripture that we have. Now, <clears throat> you have, it's what they call the Tanakh, which is, you have the Torah, which is the five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And then you have the, the historical books, Joshua, Judges, uh, 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles. And that's basically the history of Israel. The other books, the poetic books, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, those are supplemental, aren't they? See, they don't continue the history. Uh, so if you read, read your Bible, and even Leviticus is supplemental, and Deuteronomy is supplemental, uh, Ruth is supplemental, um, uh, first and second chronicle, first and second chronicles are supplemental because really first and second chronicles just repeats the same history that you're going to find in uh, second Samuel and first and second Kings. And so when you're reading the history, you know you go through Joshua and Judges and then the time of the United Kingdom and then the time of the divided kingdom, and you end up basically at the end of second chronicles. Okay, so the poetic books are tacked on. You know they're they're supplemental. They don't continue the history. And the, the prophets don't continue the history either. Now, um, so they're, they're supplemental. So the way they have it set up in the, in the Hebrew Bible is that Second Chronicles is basically the last of the Old Testament. Now what's the importance of that? Well, in Malachi chapter 4, uh, in verse 5, it says, Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. The last word in the Old Testament in our Bible is curse. The last word in the prophets is the word curse. And I think it's really important. Verse 5 and 6 is really important because that's really, as the Old Testament ends, that's what they were looking for. That's why when John the Baptist came, they said, it's Elias. Or when Jesus says to Peter, who do men say that I am? Some say that you're Elias. They're looking for Elijah. When he's on the cross and he said, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, they thought he was calling for Elijah. And they said, don't, don't do anything. Let's see if Elijah will hear him. Let's see if Elijah will come. They were expecting Elijah to come. And of course, John the Baptist was a type of Elijah. But once God has finished with the church that goes back working with Israel in the tribulation period, uh, Elijah will indeed come. And I believe that's one of the prophets that we find in the book of the Revelation. And the point that he makes here is that um, Elijah's future ministry will be successful, really unlike his first ministry. He kind of failed in his first ministry. 
uh, but there's there's something else that's happening. Of course, he was taken to heaven in the whirlwind, but he's coming back, and he will have a ministry that will be successful. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children uh, and the heart of the children to their fathers, and he will have a successful ministry, and I believe that's how many of the Jewish people get saved during the tribulation period. But if you come over to Second Chronicles chapter 36, we see that this... Uh, their, their history books end with this wonderful promise of what it has to do with the temple. In verse 23, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth hath the Lord God of heaven given me, and he hath charged me to build him an house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? The Lord his God be with him, and let him go up. Now, that's if I was a Jewish person, that's kind of where I'd like it to end too, because it's speaking about the temple. And that really that's still in the hearts of, of, of Orthodox Jewish people. If you go to Jerusalem, there's several uh, groups, but the most uh, prominent one is the Temple Institute. And they have a, a, a museum right there by the Western Plaza, the, of the Western Wall, the Whelan Wall. And you can go in there, and we've talked about that before. They've actually made all of the uh, utensils and the, the vessels that the, the high priest would use and the priest would use in the temple. They've actually selected coinin. Uh, Levites and they're actually doing these uh, mock uh, sacrificial systems um, where for example they, um, they they don't tell you where they're doing it because it's very politically very sensitive but on the Passover they select lambs and they sacrifice the lambs uh, you can if you have Facebook you can get on their Temple Institute you'll read all about it but it's very much important and when we were there and speaking to them the passion that they had to see uh, really the, the third temple to go up, um, the, the temple uh, for the future sacrifices of Israel. Now that's going to be important because what you're seeing here in the return is kind of like a little picture of what's going to happen in the end times. Now before Jesus comes back, there has to be a, a temple in, in Jerusalem. In fact, there has to be a temple in Jerusalem by the middle of the tribulation according to Second Thessalonians chapter 2. There doesn't have to be a temple at the beginning but what you're going to find is that the Feast of, of Trumpets is really a revival of Judaism and really the, the revival of the Judaistic uh, sacrificial system. Now, you're going to find when they come back, they didn't sacrifice in the temple immediately because the temple wasn't built yet. But as soon as they got back on the first day of the seventh month, which is the Feast of Trumpets, they did sacrifice. They basically built an altar and they sacrificed. You know, if, if the Jewish people had their way on the Temple Mount and they wanted to, to do sacrifice, they wouldn't have to build a temple at first. They would just simply make an altar and they would, t and they would bring uh, the animals and they would do sacrifice. And that would be the first time since 70 AD that that happened. Now that's promise that's going to take place in the future. And this is kind of like a, a, a foretaste. It's, there's little pictures here that you'll see prophetically. Um, that there will be um, a last day's return to the land. There will be a revival of Judaism, a revival of the sacrificial system, which in the middle of the tribulation, three and a half years in, the Antichrist goes in and stops. And that's part of the, the calendar that we, we're going to read about here in Daniel chapter number 9. So we have a promise of captivity, and we have a promise of Cyrus. And Cyrus is the deliverer. He is you know, the who of the deliverance. But the last thing we want to see here is the promise of a command. And this is the when of the deliverance. So let's go over to Daniel chapter 9. <clears throat> In Ireland, they used to call me Mr. Daniel because I used to preach through Daniel regularly. Um, I don't know if I... I mean, they just depict on me, I think. But um, it's, it's certainly a book of interest because you can't really understand Revelation until you understand Daniel. And probably, you know, there's two prophecies in Daniel that are backbone prophecies. One is Daniel chapter 2, the image of the Gentile powers, Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, Rome. And then at the end of the Roman Empire, which did divide Eastern and Western, then you have these feet that are made of iron and clay. The clay is not soft clay, but it's like potter's clay. It's like uh, pottery. And so the iron is, is hard and it's durable. And yet it's mixed in with this Mary clay, which is brittle, and it breaks. Now, to be honest with you, I have no idea really what that's speaking about, other than the fact that in these last days, you have people that are nationalistic, that would be hard, right-wing, if you like, 
And you also have left wing, you have people that are globalism and it's, it's soft. It's, um, and you have them mixed together, but then it says, that, but they don't, they don't really, they don't gel. They don't really mix together. But, but in the, in the days of, of, of that final, um, manifestation of a revived Roman empire, there are 10 Kings symbolized by the 10 toes. And, and of course the important part is that in the days of those Kings, this is Daniel chapter 2. The God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. And we see the, the stone that is cut out without hands. It's supernatural. It's in heaven. And the stone comes from heaven to the earth. And it smashes the image upon its feet. And the whole image just crumbles. And the wind comes and blows it away. And then the stone that is left grows. And it grows into a mountain that fills the whole earth. And that stone is Christ and his kingdom. And the important thing, there's many important things, but the, probably the most important thing about that is that we understand that Christ's kingdom does not coexist with Gentile kingdoms. If you're now millennials, you believe we're in the kingdom. This is the kingdom. And so you have Gentile powers that are controlling the world and controlling Israel. Um, by the way, that's the Temple Mount is still, is, that's, the, that's, the, that's, the, that's the epicenter. Do you know who controls the Temple Mount? Do you know who has jurisdiction over it? You would say Jerusalem. You would say uh, Netanyahu and the Israeli government. Now, they, they have security concerns there. But the people who run that are the Jordanians. Jordan has control. Gentiles have control of the Temple Mount. And so <clears throat> uh, when Christ comes, he's going he's gonna to replace. There's not going to be Jesus plus all the governments of the world. Um, he, he is in control of all things. And so, he, so in other words, we're not in the kingdom yet. Because the Gentiles are, this is the time of the Gentiles. And when the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled, that's when Christ comes and he sets up his kingdom. And he is king of kings and lord of lords. Amen. But the other prophecy you find here is in Daniel chapter 9. These are the two primary backbone prophecies of premillennialism. In Daniel chapter 2, the image. And then in Daniel chapter 9, the calendar. Because in Daniel chapter 9, look at it, verse 1. It says, <clears throat> in the first year of Darius, the son of Asuros, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. Now, you understand that a lot of times in prophetic books, it's not one chapter follows another chapter, a sequence like that. Uh, Darius came in, go back to chapter 5 and look at verse uh, 30. Belshazzar was the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. <clears throat> and it says, And in that night was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, slain, and Darius the Median took the kingdom being about three score and two years old, 62 years old when he took the thing over. So basically, here he is now in the first year of Darius. So chapter 9 is actually comes right after chapter 5 chronologically. Okay? In fact, <clears throat> when you get to chapter 6 of Daniel, that's when he's in the lands then. And he's at the end of his life. Now he's still got another six chapters to go in Daniel. But the first six chapters really record what happened historically in his life. And the last six chapters are dealing with prophetic and things and visions and prophecies, you see. So it's not like uh, each chapter is consecutive. Um, so Daniel chapter 9 really is right after Babylon is defeated, the media Persians have arrived, and Daniel's saying, what, what now? What next? And in Daniel chapter 1, uh, or sorry, chapter 9, in verse 2, it says, In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So he's got Jeremiah open, he's got Isaiah open, and he's reading the scriptures and the prophecies concerning the time of judgment. It's going to be 70 years. They knew it would be 70 years. Daniel had lived basically right through all of them. He's getting to the end of the 70 years now, and he's trying to figure out what's going to happen next. And so he begins to pray. He fasts and he prays. Verse 3, And I sat my face unto the Lord God to seek my prayer and supplication with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. I prayed unto the Lord my God and made confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God. And he begins this prayer begging God to help him to understand what was going to happen to his people and praying for his people. Because the 70 years are up, now what? And so we come to uh, verse 19, he says, he, he ends his prayer, O Lord, hear, O Lord, forgive, O Lord, hearken and do, defer not for thine own sake, O my God, 
for thy city and thy people are called by thy name. Who's he praying for? He's praying for the Jews. What city is he praying for? He's praying for Jerusalem. Because up to this point, it's been laying in rubble since Nebuchadnezzar burned it and pulled the walls down. Now verse 20 says, And while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God. What is the holy mountain? It's Jerusalem. And it's really Mount Moriah. It's, it's, uh, it's Zion. It's, it's where the temple would be. Verse 21, Yea, whilst I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation, and he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplication, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore understand the matter and consider the vision. So now God sends a messenger, Gabriel, to help uh, Daniel understand what was going to happen with his people and with Jerusalem. And what, what he gives him here is a calendar of events. It's a time frame. And the time frame is going to run 490 years, which is kind of interesting because for 490 years they disobeyed God. And so 490 years divided by seven gives you 70 years of the, of the captivity. And so uh, he's going to give a time frame here of 490 years. He's going to tell you when it starts. And he's going to tell you what happens at the end of it. Okay, so look at verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. Okay, now the word weeks there is the word in Hebrew for sevens. Seventy sevens. Well, seven what? We don't know. It's like, it's like me saying to you seventy dozens. Well, dozens of what? A dozen means what? A dozen means twelve. And the word here in Hebrew simply means seven. So 70 sevens are determined upon Israel. Now, you're going to see that it turns out that it's actually seven years. It's 70 times seven years, which is 490 years. You'll say, how do you know that? Because of how the prophecy was fulfilled. Because he's going to give you the start point, and then he's going to give you markers along the way. And the most important marker is after the, six, the, the 69th year. So there's seven years, and then 62 years, which gives you 69 years. And after 69 years, the Messiah would be cut off, but not for himself. Okay. And of course, um, that's, that's 283 years. Okay, so let's read on, because here's what happens at the end of that calendar. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people, upon thy holy city, to finish the transgression. The word thee there is the definite article. It's not transgressions or different kinds of transgression. It is the transgression. What do you think that the transgression is? I mean, if you were to guess what the, trans, uh, the, trans, the transgression of Israel would be, what would it be? Huh? Idolatry. Idolatry, Idolatry yeah. The rejection, of the rejection of Christ. Would you not think that that's the biggest one? Yeah. Because yeah. Yeah. that's really the thing that's uh, holding everything back, yeah. mm-hmm. the rejection of Christ. And But this period of time will end that. There will be no more rejection of Christ at the end of this period of time. So to finish the transgression, then it says, and to make an end of sins. Okay, so there's, there will be nothing between Israel and her God forever after this. To make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity. Now he's speaking about the whole people. He's speaking about the city. And to bring in everlasting righteousness. This has to be speaking about Christ and his kingdom. And to seal up the vision and prophecy. You know, once, uh, you know, when Jesus comes and sets up his kingdom, I mean, obviously in the kingdom there's different things fulfilled, but basically uh, his, the whole prophetic purpose for all of the prophets concerning Israel is fulfilled. You know, they were basically warning about judgment and then they were talking about, uh, how that God was going to, you know, overrule that, bring them back. There would be reconciliation and things would be settled between them and God. And so uh, it's going to see, in other words, prof- there's no more need for prophecy at that particular point, to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Now, the most holy there, I believe, is speaking about the temple that will be in Jerusalem that is spoken about uh, from Ezekiel chapter 43, the end of the book, the millennial temple. 
and it gives you the dimensions. When David Muir was here several years ago, uh, he gave you a, a chart that basically had, and you can you can Google this, the Millennial Temple, and it's there's so much information in Ezekiel that describes it that they can actually a draftsman can draw the thing out, and it's unlike anything that they've known before. But it's going to be anointed, and the, the most important part of that is the Christ will be there. Okay, He will be the object of our worship to anoint the most holy. So in other words, verse 24 is saying, here's a, here, here's a calendar of events, and at the end of it, everything's right. At the, end, at the end of it, basically everything is fulfilled. The Christ is here, the kingdom has come, and everything you're worrying about, Daniel, is, is, is in the past. Once this thing is completed, there's nothing more to look forward to as far as reconciliation or getting things right or um it's this this is reconciliation this is everything getting right uh this is the making an end of sin this is uh bringing to close the uh, finishing the the transgression so it's a very important prophecy it's a very important calendar because at the end of this period of time you know you're basically arraigned you know christ has come the messiah has come and uh we're in, we're in that everlasting righteousness Okay, so we'll need to know, if we know when it, what's going to happen when it ends, well, we need to know when it starts. We know how long it is. It's 70 times 7, which is 490 years. Okay, but when when is it going to start? Because obviously we need to know when it starts to know when it finishes. So he tells you that in verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem... Unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks, that's 49 years, and three score and two weeks, the street shall be built again, the wall, even in troublous times. Now, of course, and I want you to look at your, your notes there again. He's saying, <clears throat> this calendar starts when the command goes forth to restore and build Jerusalem. The problem for us is that there's at least three commands that we find in Scripture, that they're commanded to go back. And if you look at your note, notes there, uh, this command to return was given first by the Persian king Cyrus when Zerubbabel returned to build the temple. And that's the primary uh, purpose of, of Zerubbabel. And I, uh, go back to um, Ezra. Keep your place there, Daniel. Go back to Ezra chapter 2. Now, we're going to get into this next week, but it's not that um, Sarah says, Zerubbabel, you're the man. Lead a, lead a group back. Now, Artaxerxes says that with Nehemiah. But Sarah just says, any, any of you Jews want to go back? And a whole bunch of them said yes. And it's only when you get to chapter 2, verse 2, it says, which came, uh, talking about, let's see, uh, he came again to Jerusalem, verse 1, and Judah, everyone unto his own city, which came with Zerubbabel, Joshua, Nehemiah, uh, Sariah, uh, Ragai, Mordecai. By the way, Nehemiah and Mordecai there are not the Nehemiah and Mordecai that you know in Esther and in Nehemiah. These, it's, you know, not everybody um, had you know completely different names. There's more than one Nehemiah. There's more than one um, uh, Mordecai. But Zerubbabel went back. Uh, here's the the first year of Cyrus as king, and he's he's making this. Uh, available for these Jews to go back but is that the beginning of the commandment and I, I don't believe it is okay uh, then you have Artaxerxes in his seventh year look at uh, chapter 7 verse 8 of Nehemiah <clears throat> we'll look at verse 1 it says now after these things in the reign of Artaxerxes king of Persia Ezra the son of Zerari uh, and so on, verse 6, this Ezra went up from Babylon, and he was a ready scribe. He was a, a Levite in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given. And the king granted him all his requests according to the hand of the Lord his God upon him. So Zerubbabel goes up first with the first wave, and that was really the most of the people. It was almost 50,000 people that went. And so then Zerubbabel goes to build, it's not the walls, it's not Jerusalem. He goes to build the temple. So it's temple first. 
Then later Ezra comes and he's a scribe because the people are they're all over the place spiritually. So he comes to teach them. He's actually sent by Artaxerxes to go and teach them the law of, of God. And that happened in the seventh year. Look at verse 10. And for Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it uh, and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. And in verse 8, and he came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which is the se- in the seventh year of the king. So the seventh year of Artaxerxes, then go to Nehemiah. Uh, chapter uh, chapter 2 and in the Old Testament in the, in the Hebrew books Ezra and Nehemiah were actually one book at one time but and there's there's many things that are similar some of the passages are similar as well but in chapter 2 verse 1 it says and it came to pass in the month of Nisan in the 20th year of Artaxerxes the king okay so this is basically 445 BC and this is, what, uh, 13 years after Ezra came back. Now Nehemiah is coming back, and he's coming to build the wall. So you get those three returns, Zerubbabel Temple, Ezra people, um, and Nehemiah walls. And we believe that Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 1, is the beginning of the calendar. Now, <clears throat> why would we believe that? First of all, in, in verse 1 here of chapter 2, it actually doesn't just give you the, the year. It gives you the month. It came to pass in the month Nisan, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes. Now, we know from secular history when this was, 445 BC. Um, what, 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 is the month of, what is the significance of the month of Nisan? You say, well, that, that's car. <laughs> Travis works for Nissan, right? Okay. Nissan, what happened on the 14th of Nissan? The 14th of Nissan, what was, uh, what was that? Right? It was the 14th of Nissan is the Passover, right? And so Nissan is the first, it's, it's the first month in the, in the religious calendar. It's kind of like they've got a civil calendar which starts um, later on in like September. But their religious calendar, this, God said to Moses, this is the first month of the year unto you. And, the, and you shall take a, a lamb uh, on, the t- on the 10th day of the month, and you shall keep it up until the 14th day of the month. And on the 14th day of the month, all of Israel shall kill the Passover. Okay, so Nisan is spring. It's about March or April time of the year. Now, uh, this is when the commandment went forth. And then it says in Daniel, it says, Unto Messiah the prince shall be three score and two weeks. Now here's, because we've got four minutes left. From the time of the commandment to go forth and restore Jerusalem unto the Messiah the prince, okay, is going to be exactly so many years, actually 483 years. Okay, 69 times 7, 483 years. So if the commandment went forth in, in, in the month of Nisan, then Jesus would have to be presented in the month of Nisan. Now when Jesus rode the donkey into Jerusalem, it was five days before Passover. You're to choose out a lamb on the 10th day. You're to bring it home. You're to keep it up until the 14th day. Jesus presented himself. He came to the temple on the 10th of Nisan. So Uh, Here you have the commandment to go forth and to build Jerusalem in the month of Nisan. And Jesus is presented on the month of Nisan. So it would be exactly uh, 483 years. It wouldn't be uh, 482 and a half years or 482 and three months. It would be exactly 12 on the 12 month calendar, 483 years from Nisan to Nisan. And Jesus would present himself as the Messiah, the King of Israel. Now, there, there is a little calculation that you have to do here because you, you say, well, well, when did Jesus die and when did this happen? 483, 445 from 483. And, but one of the things you have to do is when you take the last year, the last week, the last period of seven years, which we call the tribulation period. See, this is why it's described in, in, in the book of Revelation chapter 12 and in the book of Daniel as a time, a times, and a dividing of a time. Time is one year, times is two years, the dividing of time is half a year, so three and a half years. It's also called 42 months. It's also called 1260 days. 
You say, well, why is that important? Because 1260 days divided by 30, not 31, not 29, not 28, but 30. Um, so it, it, in other words, 42 months times 30 is 1260 days. So the months are 30-day months. They are lunar months. And this is why you've got a little discrepancy between the Roman calendar and the Jewish calendar, the solar calendar, lunar calendar. But if you read back into the 483 years that they are 12 months at 30-day months, okay, you end up with the exact time from the time that the commandment went forth by Artaxerxes in his 20th year in the month of Nisan until Jesus entered into Jerusalem riding on the donkey in the month of Nisan. And if you go back uh, to Daniel and look at uh, chapter 9 again and, and look at verse 26. I thought to myself, I'm going to have plenty of time to do this. It says, And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off and not for himself. What happened five days after he presented himself? He was crucified. He died, but not for himself. And then it says, And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city. So there's a prince that's coming. Now, that's not Jesus. Because the people of the prince is the Romans. Those people are the Romans. And they came in in 70 AD under Vespian and the Roman general Titus, and they destroyed Jerusalem and they destroyed the sanctuary. The, prince, the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with the flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. Now what that tells you, the most important thing that tells you is this, is that there's a, a gap here. Because Jerusalem was destroyed basically 40 years after Jesus would come. Well, you only had one year of the prophecy left. So after 483 years, Jesus presented and he was cut off. But then, what about that last seven years? Seven years after Jesus died was the end of the transgression. Was reconciliation for iniquity made? Did it bring in everlasting righteousness? No. What happened seven years after Jesus died? Nothing. But 40 years after he died, the Romans came in and they smashed the city, they wrecked the city. What that tells you is something happened to the calendar. What happened to the calendar? It stopped. Jesus said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou the high often what I've got, but you would not behold your houses left unto you desolate. He stopped the clock. And for 40 years there was a gap, and then that part of the prophecy was fulfilled. That the people of the prince that shall come. Well, what about the prince that shall come? Look at verse 27. And he, the prince that shall come, shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. There's the last week. What about that last seven years? Where is it? It's right there in verse 27. And he, the prince that shall come, shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. <coughs> and in the midst of the week. What's that? It's three and a half years in. He shall cause the sacrifice and the blessing to cease. That ties in with 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The Antichrist goes into Jerusalem, into the temple, and he sets himself up as God, the abomination of desolation. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make desolate even till the consummation. So the point is, there's a promise. There's a promise here of this calendar of events that ultimately when it is finished, because that last seven years has to run, when's it going to happen? We don't know. It's out there somewhere. And what we have is in this gap, in this time when the calendar has stopped, when the pendulum has been uh, stationary, God has dropped in this period of time that's un undetermined. It's called the church, the church age. And when God is finished with us, then he goes back working with Israel, starts the pendulum quick, kick, uh, 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 moving again. And, that's, and it will begin when the Antichrist is revealed and he makes a covenant with many for one week. And so the beginning of the tribulation starts when the Antichrist, who is not revealed yet, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, will be revealed. And he's revealed as he makes that promise to the nation of Israel. And so there's a promise of captivity, a promise of Cyrus, who is the, the who of the deliverance, and then the promise of a command, and that is the when of the deliverance. And ultimately it will happen uh, when Jesus comes back. Father, thank you for your word. We pray you bless it as we piece these pieces together. In Jesus' name, amen.